Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may be. I warmly welcome you to today's webcast brought to you by the UBS Center for Economics in Society. My name is David Emus. I am a UBS Foundation Associate Professor of Economics of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Department for Economics at the University of Zurich. Most of you will probably be familiar with the phrase, winter is coming. Unfortunately, these three words have taken on a whole new meaning in the current context. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has pushed Europe in an energy crisis with no equivalent for nearly half a century. The current situation is very uncertain. We don't know whether there will be enough energy in Europe for the winter. We don't know what far-reaching consequences the high energy prices will have for the economy in the already difficult environment of high inflation. We don't know what the consequences for government budgets or for the climate transition will be. So I'm very happy to have Steve Sikala with us today who is an absolute expert in the field of energy policies. He will hopefully be able to give us some answers to these questions. Steve is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at Tufts University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research. He's also co-director of the NBER project on the economic analysis of regulation. His work focuses on the economics of regulation, particularly with respect to environmental and energy policy. And he recently made the cover of the Washington Post. Today, Steve will speak to us about the European energy policy at war. But before we start, here is some information for the audience. After the presentation, we have a Q&A. You can ask questions during Steve's presentation or vote on post question. So please, take your mobile phone or open a new tab in your internet browser and go to menti.com and dial in with the code A378-2929. Press Open Q&A. Even if you don't have any question, you can still log in and see all the submitted questions and also vote for the best ones by giving them a thumbs up. But now let me uh, give the floor to Steve. Steve, you can go. Okay, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to uh, be discussing the energy crisis in Europe. I think the, the figure that sort of speaks for itself uh, is uh, one of just looking at energy prices over time. Uh, they have risen about tenfold uh, from a baseline of between 15 and, and $20 to, uh, you know, over the, this past summer, uh, greater than 200. These are average monthly prices. So these are sustained prices over the, the course of the month, uh, now settling to about $160. Electricity prices at the same time have seen a similar pattern. They are up about tenfold. These are issues that uh, have significant consequences for the profitability of businesses, for the ability of uh, households to uh, live comfortably, stay warm, and for now governments to stay solvent. Now, we sort of focus on this one dimensional aspect of the problem. We see prices are high and are tempted to think that the problem is that the price is high. And if that were the case, it would be very simple to just prevent the price from being high by saying prices can't be high. Uh, and so when governments step in and say, our solution to this problem is just to guarantee a price ceiling uh, or a price break, what we're going to do today is think about the, the consequences of that kind of policy, understand more than this one dimensional problem of prices high, that's bad, prices low, that's good, and think about the consequences uh, of these policies in the context of the economics of energy markets and how such uh, interventions are, are likely to have consequences beyond the initial intention of just keeping prices low. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, some of the evidence that we have for these really foundational economic concepts from the economics research, and in that light, discuss what has uh, what have governments in in Europe been doing, and uh, sort of how do we rate the actions of of European governments uh, in light of, uh, of this understanding of of how energy markets work. Uh, and, and after that, wrap up with some, some principles for, for getting out of the crisis. 
So the first question is just sort of what kind of crisis is this? We're, we often refer to it as an, an energy crisis. That could be a, a gas, a transportation, oil, or, or electricity. And, and so it might not be immediately obvious of why electricity prices are higher when the, the issue would seem to be gas. And so for that, the, I think best way to explain it is in the context of how wholesale electricity markets work. Uh, this is how uh, grid operators decide which power plants are going to operate over the course of the day to keep lights on. So this is what many would recognize as a, a kind of supply curve. Uh, the engineers call it a merit order. Uh, this is from uh, pre-crisis times from a, a few years back uh, in Germany. And the x-axis here is installed capacity. Uh, and so you see renewables and nuclear energy have the, the lowest cost. The y-axis is the marginal cost of, of generating uh, electricity from that source. So you line up the, the sources in order of increasing marginal cost. And demand at any one moment in time is perfectly inelastic. This is how much electricity must be generated in order to keep the lights on. And that's something that fluctuates over time. So at night when people aren't consuming very much, the price will drop as say uh, lignite becomes the, the marginal generator. And then during peak times when uh, a lot of electricity is being used, then it will depend on whatever the, the price of oil or, or gas is in order to set the price of electricity. Now, when you set the price of electricity there, all of the inframarginal generators are gonna earn the difference between their marginal cost and the price that clears the market. And those rents are going to cover, say, the, the cost of installing capacity uh, or, or other costs of the, the plant and be received as, as producer rents. But what happens is as fuels change in their prices, they're going to shift and rotate in this curve uh, what the, the price of electricity is. So what that means is in moments when uh, demand is relatively high and gas is the marginal generator, well, when the price of gas is high, that's going to raise the price that clears the market. And so uh, electricity is going to be more expensive. And so there's this connection between the gas market and the electricity market due to the fact that when you're a seller of gas, you effectively are going to choose whatever is the, the most profitable uh, destination for selling your fuel. You can either sell it to businesses and households to, to burn it as gas, or you can sell it to generators. Right? And so the fact that it's more valuable to, to use uh, for making electricity means that uh, the prices are going to be bid up for, for gas consumers. Okay, now what this means is in, in terms of how we think about the, uh, the current situation is that any expansion in electricity generation, right? That can be from getting nuclear plants online. It can be from uh, uh, refurbishing mothballed uh, coal plants or importantly, expanding renewables means that you're potentially burning less gas uh, in order to meet demand. And burning less gas in order to meet demand means that the gas that we can bring in is available for other sources. The price of that gas comes down. And to the extent that gas is the marginal generator, the fact that we've now made more gas available lowers the price of gas. And from this connection we've just discussed, lowers the price of electricity as well. And so it's really important to think about how conserving, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, electricity in order to bring uh, how much electricity we're consuming down, uh, or on the other hand, expanding the supply of non-gas electricity are ways of consuming, uh, of conserving gas, and that helps reduce the extent of the crisis. That, that ultimately the problem is the scarcity of gas and the success of policy is going to be judged on the extent to which we're conserving that gas. Are we making gas more available or are we making gas less available? Ultimately, the high price of gas is a symptom of scarcity, right? It is not the problem itself. I, I understand people thinking about their own, uh, you know, household economic interests. The problem is the price. But from a social perspective, from a policymaker's perspective, 
the high price is a symptom of the scarcity and anything uh, done by a policymaker to reduce the scarcity by burning less gas, by importing more, all of those things are going to uh, reduce the extent of the crisis and, and reduce prices. And anything done to pretend that that scarcity isn't there to lower prices and encourage further uh, consumption is actually going to make the problem worse. Okay, so uh, a lot of times when we talk about um, uh, the, the current situation, we frame it in the terms of, of do we have enough gas? Uh, or the problem is the, the, the prices themselves. And we sort of take as fixed that these two things are interconnected. And the policies that we need to think about are what could we do to reduce consumption uh, of gas um, and, or expand supply for that matter. All right. So uh, I'm going to highlight a, a few papers that I think really speak to this issue in particular. The first is, uh, you're going to be very surprised to hear this from an economist, that demand curves slope down. That when households face higher or lower prices of fuels, it, you shouldn't take how much they need as some fixed quantity. How much they consume is going to respond to what the price is. So this was a, a paper from uh, Derry, Gina, McKay, and uh, Reif, uh, where they looked at a setting in Illinois where uh, electricity retailers uh, effectively uh, switched who they were procuring power from. They had previously been locked into a very high cost producer and they sort of very suddenly and, and in a quasi random fashion switched to a lower cost contract. So what we see on the left here is the extent to which prices dropped very quickly and uh, very suddenly and for a persistent period of time. And what we see is that households increased the amount of electricity that they were consuming in response to that drop in price. So the short term effect, we, we speak in terms of elasticities. So that is for a 1% increase in the price, there was a 0.1% uh, decrease in consumption in the short term. And that grew to 0.3 in the longer term. So when we think of doubling the price of electricity, you should think of a 10% immediate reduction in electricity consumption and a 30% reduction in the longer run as households make uh, investment decisions to consume more or less power uh, reflecting the, those new prices. Now, that was from an example where the price fell. There was another uh, experiment uh, run by Ito Tanaka and Ida in Japan where what they did was... Um, present households in a, a randomized control trial with critical peak pricing that is on a certain number of days where the demand for electricity was particularly high. And so the cost of generating electricity was particularly high. Households in the treatment group got messages saying, demand is really high, uh, please reduce your consumption. They call that moral suasion and is something that we see quite a lot of today of, of just sort of asking people in the social interest to reduce their consumption. And another group received what they call economic incentives. They faced higher prices. And here it's significantly higher prices. So the baseline price was about 25%. In the strongest treatment group, it quadrupled. So much higher prices, uh, you know, something that speaks to the order of magnitude that we're currently seeing. And there was a much stronger response and consumption among the households that received the price incentives than the moral suasion the price incentives go a lot farther than just asking people to reduce their consumption. And that's, I think, going to be really important for how we evaluate the policies that, that are being employed today. Uh, additionally, when we think about industrial production, uh, uh, what we have on the left here is uh, the consumption of gas from the industrial sector in the EU, where the green line is showing that there has been, in fact, quite a drop in industrial gas consumption. But we don't see that there's been much of a drop in industrial output. And the reason for that is that the, the firms that would say that they are structurally important to the economy or, you know, essential, could not be done without, that firms are finding ways to substitute 
uh, those high energy intensive products with imports from abroad, say from fertilizer or aluminum. And so all of the sectors of the, of the economy that use fertilizer and aluminum find that there are actually many ways of buying fertilizer and aluminum from abroad. You don't need to burn gas in Europe where it's incredibly expensive. There are better ways to, to economize on it. Switching to the supply side, and many will have seen that uh, that France is fully uh, nationalizing EDF. And to think about what are potentially the incentives that that will have for the productivity uh, of this firm at a time when supply is really important. So this is a paper from Davis and Wolfram that looked at the deregulation of nuclear power plants in the United States and found that when they switched from either government-owned or uh, investor-owned utilities, where they had a guaranteed rate of return and lived a pretty comfortable, quiet life as long as they made the regulator happy, which is not uh, entirely uh, unanalogous, so pretty parallel to what's happening in EDF today. When they deregulated these plants, these firms got much better at coordinating their downtime. So what we see here in May and uh, October, November, are the, the typical maintenance and refueling times for nuclear plants. They got much better at coordinating these to make sure that the plants were available to run because they really felt what the opportunity cost of production was going to be. Not only that, the producers or the owners of these plants figured out ways to actually uprate the potential production from these plants. So there was an expansion in actual generation capacity from these nuclear plants that they were basically comfortably sitting around with idle capacity that they weren't using, that was available to use. And when the firms became the residual claimants of any production, they came to understand that they were leaving a lot of money on the table. That's something we're going to uh, discuss in, in just a second. And that really encouraged them to increase their supply. All right. So it, what we're learning here is that prices are, are, are really important. Uh, what have governments been doing uh, during this crisis? So this is from uh, Bruegel, who's been uh, compiling a list of the, the various government policies during the crisis. We see the first very common policy that many governments are enacting are reducing the, the taxes or other fees on energy prices as ways of reducing the price of consumption. Also very important has been transfers to vulnerable groups. But overall, I would say the, the lion's share of expenditure have gone towards or will be going towards measures to mute the price incentives to conserve energy, whether it's gas or electricity. This is a, a price break or assurance of what the price is going to be this summer and leaving the government on the hook for whatever the actual cost of consumption is above that, that price break. The magnitudes that we're talking about here are, are, are really eye-popping. Um, so this is uh, somewhat dated also from, from Bruegel in that Germany has just uh, announced uh, in the neighborhood of $200 billion. But even before that, what we're looking at for the EU is on the order of half a trillion euros for the coming year, not so much for uh, incentives of, of investment, but for assuring prices, all right? And another way of saying is that sort of... Uh, assuring uh, households and firms that the investments that they might use to reduce their consumption won't necessarily be money saving or profit maximizing for them because the government is going to pick up the tab this year, prospectively in future years. To put in perspective what half a trillion euros is, when we think about the ambitious uh, repower uh, policy for transitioning the grid to renewables, the plans for that were to spend 210 billion between now and 2027. So over a five-year plan or a five-year horizon, they were going to spend 200 billion. And so the numbers that we're looking at now, not to necessarily invest all of that much, but just to uh, shield households from the real price, uh, the real scarcity that they're facing is double that for one year. Right? So when we're repeating this again next year, we're going to be in the same boat 
of trying to shield households and businesses from uh, the scarcity itself, effectively pretending that that scarcity does not exist by holding prices at, at levels that uh, existed when the scarcity was not around. Right? That is sort of thinking about the opportunity cost of what these funds could be used. Just the order of expenditure that we're talking about here is uh, is really staggering. Okay, so uh, sorry, this skipped ahead. I wanted to talk about a, a particular case just to really drive home uh, that this isn't just some theoretical economic idea of demand curve sloping downwards, supply curve sloping up, but it has a real tangible impact in how we think about what opportunity cost is, about sort of misusing um, uh, these scarce resources that could be put to more valuable use. So there was an announcement in, in September uh, that the top uh, uh, European aluminum smelter, which is located in France, was going to, because of energy costs, cut back their production by 22%. So we're going to think about uh, what does that cutback mean uh, in terms of what's uh, being left on the table here. So this is just a, a quick back of the envelope calculation. You can uh, look up any of these numbers for yourself. That the wholesale price of aluminum is about 2,400 euros per ton. That, that is what the value of output is for this firm. And to smelt aluminum, uh, you use electricity. It's a highly electricity intensive production process. And electricity production tends to follow wherever the lowest cost uh, sources of, of electricity are. So historically in the Pacific Northwest, where there is a lot of uh, hydropower in the United States, there was a lot of aluminum production. Uh, there's a fair amount in Iceland where there's very cheap geothermal. There is a fair amount in France where there has historically been uh, very cheap nuclear power, right? So it requires 14 megawatt hours of electricity typically to produce one ton of aluminum. Now, if you uh, open up any uh, uh, website that has the spot market price of electricity sort of averaged over the course of the month, sort of what we were looking at before, it's in the neighborhood of about $500 per megawatt hour. And what that means is that 14 megawatt hours times $500 per megawatt hour means that just the electricity expenditure alone makes it cost 7,000 euros of electricity is the input, not, they don't even have to buy the aluminum, just the electricity alone is 7,000 euros worth of electricity in order to produce 2,400 euros worth of aluminum. So they're, they're losing uh, about 5,000 euros on every ton that they produce. Now, they were saying they were scaling back by about 20%. So let's take what their production was in 2021 and look at what's left. 80% of that production is about 230,000 tons. What this means is that they're going to be leaving on the table about a billion dollars worth of electricity. This is electricity that by virtue of the price signal that we're getting from wholesale markets, we know would be of higher value use elsewhere. But it's not being diverted to those higher value uses because this plant is continuing to operate. Now, there can be any number of uh, reasons that are outside of this calculation that would uh, swamp this, but it would have to be of a magnitude of $1 billion. Now, uh, we can talk a bit more later about you know, what those might be, but I think if you were to, to ask the, the executives, they would say, well, we're not paying $500 per megawatt hour. We have a contract uh, with EDF for say $40 a megawatt hour, which is something that would make this uh, a profitable sale. And so one of the key things to emphasize is that we shouldn't be judging this continued production based on the contract that they've locked into, but the opportunity cost of that electricity. Right? In other words, uh, this plant would be the beneficiary of a windfall if they could sell their contract position, their right to consume this electricity at $40 per megawatt hour to someone who has a higher value use and is willing to pay $500 per megawatt hour instead. And the fact that they are locked into this contract is effectively, effectively forcing them to waste all of this money. 
right? They're saying it's still in our interest to continue producing aluminum because we are earning the margin between $2,400 uh, per ton and, and our cost of electricity, right? And so sort of getting outside of that narrow thinking of what is our contract price versus what is the opportunity cost and how to rearrange um, uh, contracts and release contracts so that they can be sold to the highest uses per, uh, uh, highest value uses is one of the key ways to, to get out of this crisis. Now, speaking of that, let's just sort of recap and, and think in general of sort of what are the, the high level lessons here that, that we can take away for, for guiding our way out of this crisis. I think the first key thing is to always be keeping in mind that prices guide behavior. People respond to prices, firms respond to prices, and if they don't face a change in prices, you can't expect a change in behavior, right? On the demand side, that means that there are firms who this past summer could have been installing solar panels on their roof. They could have been uh, installing additional insulation, but they would only be making those investments if they could expect a, a significant cost savings that was greater than the cost of that upfront investment. And by shielding them from prices, you're ensuring that they're not making those investments. Right. Um, uh, substitution towards low cost inputs, an example here would be uh, heat pumps, that, that households are, are not installing heat pumps. There should be effectively a race to uh, get themselves off of gas while prices are high. But if prices aren't high, they're not going to do it. Now on the demand side, the signal here is that demand curves slope upwards, right? We want to uh, ensure that producers are seeing what the opportunity cost of not producing is in order to be producing as much as they possibly can. This means um, ensuring that they are expediting their maintenance of nuclear plants in France and working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because the cost of not operating a nuclear plant is astronomically high, higher to, uh, high enough to pay for really any policy initiative that you could uh, dream of uh, in France. That money was left on the table because these plants were, were down for maintenance. And it also means that they're going to forego opportunities to invest in expanded supply, right? Firms uh, this past summer should be seeing these prices and uh, be dying to be one of the producers that could fetch one of these prices. And if you find ways to sort of uh, create uncertainty as to what prices they'll be receiving, then you're creating incentives for them to delay that supply. And that, that's really harmful uh, for trying to solve the problem, which is ultimately excess demand for gas. Next, I think it's really important as policymakers think about what policies they should enact beyond political expediency is to keep the laws of economics in mind because it's much easier to uh, use these laws of economics to achieve their goals rather than try to fight against economic principles. That is a losing and very, as we're seeing, expensive battle. More concretely, what that means is that while I think it's very important to shield vulnerable uh, households from, say, freezing over the winter, one can do that by separating the amount of aid that you're providing to these households from the price signal that there is scarcity in heating. Right? So lump sum transfers that are not muting the price signal our way of providing aid while still preserving the incentive to consume electricity. On the supply side, what we've seen some of this summer uh, are expedited approvals for say floating uh, liquid uh, gasification platforms. I, I haven't seen much uh, on, in the direction of expediting uh, permitting for the entry of clean supply or transmission capacity. When we think of the direction that Europe wants to head in any case, in terms of uh, a green grid or decarbonizing the economy, what we're looking at now is an incredible opportunity to save money by avoiding gas consumption in expediting to the maximum extent possible 
uh, that expansion in supply. And that has just not been the number one priority. I think it should be the number one priority in uh, basically just making ourselves not dependent on the gas. Um, and, and so that, I think, has been a, a, an incredibly weak spot in, in policy so far. And then finally, with this last uh, part that I was speaking about for the aluminum plant, uh, I think the, the government uh, in, in Germany has been working on this, though I haven't seen the, the details of how exactly it works, is to facilitate uh, these sales of existing contracts in order to ensure that as firms are making production decisions, they're doing that based on an understanding of what the opportunity cost of the fuel that they're burning is. Right. And if they're in a favorable contract position, they can reap the benefits of that favorable position without having to burn the fuel, conserve the fuel and send it to someone who can use it for a higher value purpose. And then finally, a last note is just to be uh, aware of, of protests of what is impossible. This is sort of a moving target that we've uh, seen change over this past year. Proposals that economists uh, have have raised have been shot down as absolutely impossible, uh, completely irresponsible even to raise, to then discover that, you know, firms are sort of anticipating that prices are going to be higher in any case and are, in fact, finding ways to substitute away. I think we need to be a bit more uh, creative about what is possible, especially in the context of thinking about what our default is and uh, continuing on the current path is spending about 500 billion dollars per year uh, just to sort of uh, pretend that the the uh, scarcity of supply doesn't exist so when we think about these impossible constraints uh, i would need convincing of, of why that uh, constraint costs more than 500 billion dollars a year to overcome uh, and then finally, uh, perhaps more so in, in Europe than the United States, though the United States is certainly guilty of this as well, is in terms of relying on industry for its expertise. Uh, these firms are very much in the business of protecting their bottom line. And so the idea that you would rely on them uh, for expertise of would it be possible for you to reduce your uh, gas consumption by 20% and then set policy based on the fact of, well, uh, the chemical firm said that they couldn't do it or the, the car firm said they couldn't do it. And so uh, we're just not going to entertain that possibility. You know, it's much more important to provide them with the price signals that reflect the scarcity and then make, allow them to make the decisions uh, that, uh, that are most economical for them. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I am looking forward to your questions. Jesse, thank you very much for your presentation. Before we start with our discussion, I would like to encourage our audience to ask uh, questions on menti.com. So, Again, please go to menti.com and log in with the code A378-2929. And with this, actually, let me ask you the, the first question. Uh, you already alluded a little bit to that in, in your presentation, but of course, governments are very concerned about uh, you know, redistributive concerns, uh, um, effects of high gas prices. So instead of essentially subsidizing uh, gas prices or electricity prices, what would be you know, the best policy advice that you could give? So the first thing that I would say uh, is that uh, it's important to think about the targeting uh, of any aid uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, higher income households aren't going to love uh, the higher prices, but they're also the ones in the best position to make investments to reduce their consumption. And larger households tend to consume more energy. And so that's actually... Um, uh, a real opportunity for higher income households uh, to uh, contribute a disproportionate uh, reduction in their uh, uh, gas and electricity consumption through these investments. But that's only going to happen if they face uh, the high prices that are prevailing in the market. And so I think the targeting between high income and low income is very important. But even if you could not do that, what's very important is separating the aid that you're providing from the prices that households and firms are facing, right? So that means uh, finding ways to uh, say, expand the social safety net. Uh, that can be for 
uh, workers who lose their job because firms need to uh, furlough workers and suspend their operations because they're too energy intensive and can't be profitable. Uh, that means uh, expanding the social safety net that helps uh, low income households uh, stay afloat. Now, to the extent that there's a social safety net, you can just expand that social safety net and just get out of the business of picking up a share of people's uh, energy bills. Good, thank you. Let me take uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, there's one with uh, a lot of likes, which is, uh, is the energy crisis in Europe an opportunity or a threat to the fight against climate change? Again, you started talking a bit about that, but maybe you can elaborate further. Uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think it's a, a bit of both. You know, a lot of times uh, pre-energy crisis, uh, when um, people have been thinking about uh, carbon taxes or, or any policies that would uh, ensure that firms and households are, are facing the, the, the social cost of their energy consumption in terms of the, the carbon content of that consumption, that meant energy prices sort of would be somewhat higher, right, in order to stimulate uh, entry from clean sources. And so uh, I think there are now some people saying, well, aren't you getting what you wished for? Energy prices are very high and people should be consuming. I think a key element here uh, is the extent to which it can be uh, anticipated and the extent to which it is persistent. Right? This happened very suddenly in an unanticipated manner and has led to, I think, really just an unorganized scramble uh, toward whatever was at hand. And that meant uh, taking coal-fired power plants out of uh, retired or mothballed status. That meant uh, very rapidly expanding uh, floating uh, liquid uh, de uh, gasification uh, platforms in order to uh, sort of lock in uh, additional carbon consumption going forward. I, I think that the, the urge to make sure that we can get through this current winter has come at the cost of thinking, of, you know, what could we, with the right price incentives, accelerate in terms of uh, decarbonization uh, investments in order to sort of achieve a long-term uh, permanent uh, solution to the, the decarbonization crisis. So I think on, on one hand, it's an incredible opportunity. It is on the other hand, one that I, I haven't seen nearly enough uh, action on or, or even consideration that what this really means is that we need to accelerate our decarbonization. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, another question from the audience um, is, is the following. So is the European Commission has called for some decoupling of uh, EU electricity prices from gas prices and an overall reform of the EU electricity market. And so what would be the consequences of that? How long would that go? Is this something that you would think would be uh, a good idea? Uh, so th this is a, a topic that is uh, near and dear to, to my own heart. Uh, much of the work that, that I do is on electricity markets and, and studying uh, how well they work, the impacts that they've had relative to uh, alternative ways of organizing the sector. Uh, and we now have, you know, on the order of 30 years of experience uh, where we've been learning uh, sort of in what ways electricity markets do and, and do not work and, and refining that and improving that. Uh, it's been a, a long process, uh, but has sort of arrived at some relative stability in terms of understanding uh, that there are major, major economic benefits from using markets to organize your production, of ensuring that um, the, the price of energy at a point reflects the opportunity cost uh, of, uh, of that good, right? So that firms have an incentive to enter when it's very high and households have an incentive to conserve uh, as well. Uh, and so I get very nervous when policymakers simply unhappy with prices uh, start meddling in uh, an industry that has been sort of refined and that we've been learning very carefully how to run uh, over the course of decades. So uh, my, my initial reaction is um, 
is that it's it's not a good idea. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly open to ideas of, of how we could potentially improve uh, the performance of, of these markets. There are certainly ways that um, there is room for improvement in terms of, uh, you know, lo- financing of long term contracts in order to to secure um, uh, price stability and, and that sort of thing. But just trying to uh, ad hoc uh, mandate prices is, um, I, I think, a, a, an approach that is um, uh is going to come with unintended consequences that the the cost of that will be far greater than any potential benefits. And that I would also add, in line with what I was discussing about incentives for supply, that when we're in this moment of very high prices and absolute you know, maximum value of supply when we want producers to be running full speed to procure their, you know, secure their supply chains in order to to enter and to produce more. Raising the possibility that all of that investment uh, might be effectively confiscated from them by changing rules uh, so that they have no certainty that they'll, you know, make any money from it is a good way of deterring entry at a moment when encouraging entry to the maximum extent possible is, you know, one of the most important things to do. Uh, and so I, I, I just find it incredibly reckless uh, and and not very well thought out. Thank you. Maybe let me you know, build up on that. So, you know, following your logic, the most important thing is really to increase, uh, to increase supply. Uh, but then that leads to the question of, well, what type of supply should we increase and what type of supply would be resilient to similar situation as what we've experienced with, uh, with Russian gas. So if we think about gas from other countries, a lot of producers, uh, maybe, you know, countries that we don't necessarily want to import from either. If we're thinking of, uh, Renewables, actually, some materials may come from, you know, China, uh, for instance, where perhaps at some point we would be in a similar situation. So how would you think about trying to expand, uh, you know, the supply of, uh, of electricity without running in 20 years in the same situation as what we've just run in with Russian gas? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think the first step I mean, it's kind of surprising that it's true, uh, but I think the first step is simply recognizing that there's a supply problem. Uh, that's something that is just far too low on the priority list. Um, and so I think just recognizing that we need to increase supply dramatically uh, and really devote significant resources to doing so would be significant progress. Um, I think that the the issues that you've raised in terms of um, uh, say, uh, solar panels coming from parts of China where forced labor is used. Um, there, there are all kinds of, I think, very difficult uh, ethical issues that countries will want to um, uh, be selective and deliberate in their procurement policies. Uh, I, I'm completely on board and understanding of all of those issues. What I would say is that those constraints are unlikely to be $500 per year constraints, right? And so we can absolutely take those into consideration and try to do it in a way that is uh, as diligent and consistent with our ethical concerns as possible. But the the cost of uh, addressing those problems, I think, is unlikely to be five hundred a five hundred dollar per year uh, reason not to. Thanks, and let me actually build up on, on that again, based on you know one question from the audience, which is about uh, fracking technology, which is you know mentioned as an alternative technology. There is a lot of shale gas in uh, in Germany, actually, but it is highly controversial. So, how would you assess uh, environmental risk associated with fracking in this con- in this context? Uh, that's a that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think it is uh, not as widely known uh, as it perhaps should be that the reason that uh, that Europe does not frack natural gas uh, is that the resources uh, that were suitable for fracking, uh, I think probably on the order of eight years ago, uh, were opposed by environmental organizations that were astroturfed by the Russian government. Uh, 
Uh, so Russia recognized that this was a threat to their stranglehold on European energy supplies. Um, so in case this sounds like a conspiracy theory mongering, like you can look on, on the New York Times, there, there was coverage of this at the time. I think it was uh, the article in the Times is, is about Romania. Uh, the environmental groups um, uh, were, were funded by Russia in order to preserve uh, uh, Russia's uh, stranglehold on, on energy supplies. Now, that being the case doesn't necessarily mean that fracking uh, on a large scale is a, a great idea for energy policy going forward. I think that uh, renewable costs have come down so significantly uh, that uh, I, I, the place I would start is the reform of permitting both for siting renewables where, you know, uh, getting a, a single turbine uh, up and running in Germany requires, you know, years of, uh, uh, of regulatory work, thousands of pages of documentation, uh, just expediting the, the permitting to recognize that this is, in fact, a, a wartime emergency and we just don't have time for this kind of stuff um, would make uh, an enormous difference to close any potential cost gap uh, between renewables and uh, and and gas. I would say, additionally, before thinking of developing uh, fracking, which does have any range of uh, environmental externalities associated with it, is just the enormous reservoir of, of conventional gas that uh, that is sitting in the Netherlands waiting to be used. Good. Um, actually, since you you know you mentioned a little bit the, the geopolitical consequences, a question from the audience, for instance, such as, you know, is it possible that uh, Russia could actually benefit more uh, through the escalation of a gas export ban and cause further, which would cause a further gas price explosion, and then fueling this way socio-political polarization and undermining Western's resolve. I'm sorry, could you say that again, that Russia would benefit more? So the question is that, you know, is it possible that a ga an export ban would actually raise price so much that it would actually benefit Russia on that? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question relates to, you know, uh, how Russia uh, will then try to uh, cause uh, social political uh, disruption. Yeah, so I think there... I mean, there are a couple of parts of the question, so a couple of parts to 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 my answer. Um, the the first is uh, in terms of you know who benefits in a relative sense uh, from the the selling of of gas. The fact that so much gas from Russia is coming over a pipeline makes um, Europe sort of a a locked in market for Russia so that Russia really won't be able to substitute very easily uh, away from Europe uh, with those purchase possibilities. Whereas uh, Europe is by the day increasingly uh, more open for, for gas imports, uh, non uh, pipeline. The, the main thing that I, I wanted to respond to though, uh, because you see it raised quite a lot by uh, opponents of shutting off Russian revenue is, is this idea of the the threat to social cohesion uh, because that is I find an incredibly uh, amorphous term that sort of people use as um, uh, uh, the, the specter of, of, of something to to win an argument because you know well we can't ha you know have a breakdown of social cohesion so there's you know pay any price for it. Uh, I think this is incredibly amorphous in terms of what is the object of social cohesion. If you have leadership uh, that is incapable of uh, focusing society's attention on exactly what the threat is before them, then. Sure, per, perhaps, you know, uh, households will be up in arms over energy prices because they have no sense of what is at stake for them. Uh, and so I think um, a bit more clear eyed leadership about what exactly is at stake for the households uh, who are paying higher energy prices that really we're talking about uh, the rules based order 
uh, that has kept peace in, in Europe since World War II, um, the danger that they're in, um, if Russia were to gain, not just prevail, but gain on net and find that uh, one can unilaterally conquer the territory of a sovereign neighbor, that this is behavior that is uh, one that delivers benefits on net and one that we can expect going forward is a rallying point for social cohesion that to me far outweighs uh, any uh, increase in energy prices. So when someone says, you know, we can't have that because there will be a breakdown of social cohesion, I think they're just not focusing on uh, what the, the focal point of, of social cohesion uh, could be. Okay, so maybe perhaps actually a, quite a, a related question. Is it possible to estimate how, how much of you know, the 500 uh, billion bill that you mentioned ends up uh, in the hands of uh, Gazprom uh, and, and Russia? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I think the fact that uh, volumes from, so uh, in part, yes, um, in an accounting sense, um, in that the, if you, I, I, Bruegel has been a, a, a valuable resource uh, for um, for tracking these kinds of data of, of flows from uh, Russia. Uh, there has been a dramatic reduction in gas purchased from Russia over this past year. Uh, and so that has uh, fallen a fair amount. And it is also uh, far, far less uh, important for Russia's finances than, than oil. Um, so I, I would recommend uh, doing some reading on, uh, I'm not sure if it's Bruegel.org, but they're, they're a, a, a Belgian think tank that has done a lot of really great work. Okay. Um, maybe, you know, one, one question, you know, in, ter in terms of what private households can do. So to what extent can private households actually try to save electricity uh, through their own behavior? That's a, a great question. I, it's one that uh, is as, has answers as diverse as houses are. Um, you know, if you're a relatively small household that does not consume a lot of energy, then there aren't a lot of opportunities necessarily for uh, re reducing your consumption. The, the larger your household, uh, is the greater your energy footprint tends to be. Um, and, and so I think it varies uh, quite a lot. Um, I think that one of the most exciting developments uh, in this area has been the, the declining cost and growing adoption of heat pumps uh, that rather than sort of uh, say burning fuel, burning gas, uh, uses electricity to move heat. Uh, so when you think of an air conditioner in the summertime, it is moving heat from in your house to outside your house. And if you stand next to an air conditioner outside in the summer, it's pretty unpleasant because it's warmer there. And what a heat pump does is it's effectively reversible. And so it can take heat in the winter from outside and move it inside. And that uncomfortable source of heat in the summer now becomes uh, a very uh, cost-effective one in your home. Now, there are, uh, there are going to be issues, I think, for a lot of European construction um, for uh, adapting their homes to that. But uh, again, the opportunity cost is $500 billion a year. I also don't think that this is necessarily a $500 billion a year obstacle uh, in terms of uh, really stimulating a very rapid uh, rollout innovation growth uh, in a technology like heat pumps that would have lasting long-term benefits rather than this, you know, every year we need to spend incredible sums to pretend that there isn't scarcity. So that's one off the top of my head. Uh, I think insulation opportunities, there are, there are all kinds of things that, you know, ultimately, uh, I think the economist's answer would be to say, uh, get the prices right and, uh, and the response will be there. The response will be from firms uh, figuring out whatever uh, low cost 
uh, high value opportunities there are for their sales and for households to discover whatever uh, low cost, high opportunities there are for them to, to save on their energy bills. But the, the key is to get the price right. And actually, in terms of getting the price right, maybe let me uh, give you the opportunity to talk about what I know is one of your favorite topics. So uh, price integration, uh, having the same price ac across the entire EU market. Uh, what role can be played by you know, elect better electricity transmission across countries, also even perhaps uh, within countries? And if you have an example on Switzerland, that could be uh, helpful. Sure. Um, so... Uh... In order to decarbonize our economy, uh, we need more transmission. Uh, ultimately, the, the difference is going to be moving from a grid where we can store fossil fuel close to where we're generating the electricity and site those electricity plants relatively close to where it's being consumed, to being at the whims of the wind blowing, uh, the sun shining, and whatever our storage capacity uh, in, in um, uh, pumped hydro reservoirs may be. It means that the greater we can uh, spread those resources out geographically in a way that is mindful of the correlation of when the wind is blowing in one place uh, versus in another and what our demand uh, on the grid is going to be, um, the 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 lower cost it will be to to decarbonize the economy. And so, uh, you know, there is uh, understandably a, a, a fair amount of opposition to building, you know, uh, uh, new transmission, uh, but getting creative in terms of simply upgrading existing transmission lines of relatively low voltage lines with high uh, voltage direct current, um, uh, greater in interconnection between countries is going to allow for uh, benefits for both producers and consumers. That whenever there's a transmission bottleneck between a city and a producer, what that means is that the, the bottleneck is driving down the price in the place where the energy is being consumed so the, the producer isn't getting top dollar for their production. And it means that some alternative higher cost generator has to step in and produce electricity where it's being consumed. And that's driving up the price in, say, population centers where it's being consumed. And so transmission between these two is analogous to opening up to trade and, and sort of preserving some, some law of one price uh, in order to reduce uh, prices for consumers in, in urban centers and raise the price that that, um, that producers get. Now, uh, you, you asked a question about uh, Switzerland because uh, I had told you that I had a, a backup slide ready here, uh, which is, if I can switch over to my slides again, uh, this price map, uh, which comes from the Swiss government, uh, are electricity prices uh, that are prevailing in Switzerland currently. And what you see here is enormous diversity uh, in the price of electricity. So in, uh, in Zurich uh, here, EWZ had locked in long-term purchase contracts and the benefits of those contracts, uh, meaning low electricity prices are currently being passed on to consumers so that this coming winter, there are gonna be highly muted incentives to reduce electricity consumption. It will be pretty economical to, to consume electricity uh, in Zurich. But if you just you know, cross a few municipalities over, these prices are more than double. And it's because those uh, utilities hadn't locked in uh, low cost electricity supply contracts. This gets back to the issue that we were discussing before uh, about the benefits of reselling contracts. There are uh, There is effectively surplus here that could be passed on to um, Zurich consumers um, in exchange for selling their contract position what that would mean is that the price of electricity in Zurich would be higher this winter. Households would have incentives to reduce their consumption this winter, and they could realize a net fall, uh, a windfall that comes from just the luck that the utility had happened to lock in a long-term contract, right? And in doing so, free up those resources 
to sell to neighboring municipalities uh, who are otherwise uh, buying from the spot market. Right? The benefit here is that that reduction in electricity consumption that comes from facing a higher price helps alleviate the overall scarcity that is the source of high energy prices overall. So as long as you know these municipalities throughout Switzerland are continuing to benefit from you know a decision that was made years ago, uh, lucky that has turned out to be lucky to keep electricity prices low, is actually harming our ability to uh, adapt to the the current scarcity. Well, th thanks again, Steve, for your answers and for for a fantastic talk. Unfortunately, we have. Uh to end here. So first, I would like to thank the audience for watching and for your question. In the fall, on November 7, we will have our half-day conference, Forum for Economic Dialogue, on the topic of superstar firms. There will be a live stream for the audience who cannot attend in person. We are proud to have former commissioner in charge of competition policy, Joachim Almunia, as, our, as a keynote speaker. He will speak about the EU competition policy as one of the strongest antitrust enforcers around the world. On the other hand, we have Eliana Garces, director in the economic policy group at Meta, also known as uh, Facebook. She will represent the point of view of a large company. The Zurich Lecture for Economics in Society will be given by Eric Posner, an American lawyer and legal consultant who has been a consultant for the antitrust division of the US Department of Justice since 2022. He wrote the book, How Antitrust Failed Workers. Therefore, if you are interested in these topics, please consider subscribing to our newsletter to receive updates on our events and activities. We look forward to welcoming you back in November. In the meantime, I invite you to follow the discussion on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can also find all the information on the forum on the UBS Center's webpage, ubscenter.uzh.ch. Goodbye.